Hello, hello. This is Corrine from the North Balford Library with Lakeland Library Region in Saskatchewan. So we are doing our kids book club where each week I will read out loud a section of Anne of Green Gables by L. M. Montgomery. In our background music, I got from bensound.com and this one is called Acoustic Breezes. Ben Sound is a royalty-free music site. So let's begin on chapter three. And whenever we're reading the story, look for my hat so that you know that I'm reading part of the story. Chapter three, Marla Cuthbert is surprised. Marla came briskly forward as Matthew opened the door. But when her eyes fell on the odd little figure in the stiff, ugly dress with the long braids of red hair and the eager, luminous eyes, she stops short in amazement. Matthew Cuthbert, who is that? She ejaculated. Where is the boy? There wasn't any boy, said Matthew wretchedly. There was only her. He nodded at the child remembering he had never even asked her name. No boy, but there must be a boy, insisted Marla. We sent word to Mrs. Spencer to bring a boy. Well, she didn't, she brought her. I asked the station master and I had to bring her home. She couldn't be left there, no matter where the mistake had come in. Well, this is a pretty piece of business ejaculated Marla. During this dialogue, the child had remained silent, her eyes roving from one to the other, all the animation fading out of her face. Suddenly, she seemed to grasp the full meaning of what had been said. Dropping her precious car carpet bag, she sprang forward a step and clapped her hands. You don't want me, she cried. You don't want me because I'm not a boy. I might have expected it. No one ever did want me. I might have known it was all too beautiful to last. I might have known nobody really did want me. Oh, what am I to do? I'm going to burst into tears. Burst into tears she did, sitting on a chair by the table, flinging her arms out upon it and burying her face in them. She proceeded to cry stormily. Marla and Matthew looked at each other deprecatingly across the stove. Neither of them knew what to say or to do. Finally, Marla stepped lamely into the breach. Well, well, there's no need to cry so about it. Yes, there is need. The child raised her head quickly, revealing a tear-stained face and trembling lips. You would cry too if you were an orphan and had come to a place you thought was going to be a home and found that they didn't want you because you weren't a boy. Oh, this is the most tragical thing that has ever happened to me. Something like a reluctant smile, rather rusty from long disuse, mellowed Marla's grim expression. Well, don't cry anymore. We're not going to turn you out of doors tonight. You'll have to stay here until we investigate this matter. What's your name? The child hesitated for a moment. Will you please call me Cordelia? She said eagerly. Call you Cordelia? Is that your name? No, it's not exactly my name, but I would love to be called Cordelia. It's such a pretty, elegant name. I don't know on earth what you mean. If Cordelia isn't your name, what is? Anne Shirley, reluctantly faltered for forth the owner of the name. But, oh please, do call me Cordelia. It can't matter much to you what you call me if I'm only going to be here a little while, can it? And Anne is such an unromantic name. Unromantic fiddlesticks, said the unsympathetic Marla. Anne is a real good, plain, sensible name. You've no need to be ashamed of it. Oh, I'm not ashamed of it, explained Anne. Only I like Cordelia better. I've always imagined that my name was Cordelia. At least, I have of later years. When I was young, I used to ma imagine it was Geraldine. 
but I like Cordelia better now. But if you call me Anne, please call me Anne spelt with an E. What difference does it make how it's spelled? asked Marla with another rusty smile as she picked up the teapot. Oh, it makes such a difference. It looks so much nicer. When you hear a name pronounced, can't you always see it in your mind, just as if it was printed out? I can. An A-N-N -N looks dreadful, but A-N-N-E -N -N looks so much more distinguished. If you'll only call me Anne, spelt with an E, I shall try to reconcile myself to not being called Cordelia. Very well then, Anne, spelled with an E. Can you tell us how this mistake came to be made? We sent word to Mrs. Spencer to bring us a boy. Were there no boys at the asylum? Oh yes, there was an abundance of them. But Mrs. Spencer said distinctly that she wanted a girl about 11 years old. And the matron said she thought I would do. You don't know how delighted I was. I couldn't sleep all last night for joy. Oh, she added reproachfully, turning to Matthew. Why didn't you tell me at the station that you didn't want me and leave me there? If I hadn't seen the white way of delight and the lake of shining waters, it wouldn't be so hard. What on earth does she mean? demanded Marla, staring at Matthew. She, she, she's just referring to some conversation we had on the road, said Matthew hastily. I'm going to put the mare in, Marla. Have tea ready when I come back. Did Mrs. Spencer bring anyone besides you? Continued Marla when Matthew had gone out. She brought Lily Jones for herself. Lily is only five years old and she's very beautiful. She has nut brown hair. If I was very beautiful and had nut brown hair, would you keep me? No, we want a boy to help Matthew on the farm. A girl would be of no use to us. Take off your hat. I'll lay it and your bag on the hall table. Anne took off her hat meekly. Matthew came back presently and they sat down to dinner, but Anne could not eat. In vain, she nibbled at the bread and butter and pecked at the crabapple preserve out of the little scallop glass dish by her plate. She did not really make any headway at all. You're not eating anything, Marla said sharply, eyeing her as if it was a serious shortcoming. Anne sighed. I can't. I'm in the depths of despair. Can you eat when you are in the depths of despair? I've never been in the depths of despair, so I can't say, responded Marla. Weren't you? Well, did you ever try to imagine you were in the depths of despair? No, I didn't. Then I don't think you can understand what it's like. It's a very uncomfortable feeling indeed. When you try to eat a lump, it comes right up in your throat and you can't swallow anything, not even if it was a chocolate caramel. I had one chocolate caramel once two years ago and it was simply delicious. I've often dreamed of since then that I had a whole lot of chocolate caramels, but I always wake up just when I'm about to eat them. I do hope you won't be offended because I can't eat. Everything is extremely nice, but still, I cannot eat. I guess she's tired, said Matthew, who hadn't spoken since his return from the barn. Best put her to bed, Marla. Marla had been wondering where Anne should be put to bed. She had prepared a couch in the kitchen chamber for the desired and expected boy. But although it was neat and clean, it did not seem quite the thing to put a girl there somehow. But the spare room was out of the question for such a stray waif, so there remained only the east gable room. Marla lighted a candle and told Anne to follow her, which Anne spiritlessly did, taking her hat and carpet bag from the hall table as she passed. The the hall was fearsomely clean. The little gable chamber in which she presently found herself seemed cleaner. Marla set the candle on a three-legged, three-cornered table and turned down the bedclothes. I suppose you have a nightgown, she questioned. Anne nodded. Yes. Anne nodded. Yes, I have two. The matron of the asylum made them for me. They're fearfully skimpy. There is never enough to go around in an asylum, so things are always skimpy at least in a poor asylum like ours. I hate skimpy night dresses. 
But one can dream just as well in them as in lovely trailing ones with frills around the neck. That's one consolidation. Well, undress as quick as you can and go to bed. I'll come back in a few minutes for the candle. I daren't trust you to put it out yourself. You'll likely set the place afire. When Marla had gone, Anne looked around her wistfully. The whitewashed walls were so painfully bare and staring that she thought they must ache over their own bareness. The floor was bare too, except for a round braided mat in the middle, such as Anne had never seen before. In a one dark corner was the bed, a high, old-fashioned one, with four dark, low-turned posts. In the other corner was the aforesaid three-cornered table, adorned with a fat red velvet pin cushion, hard enough to turn the point of the most adventurous pin. Ab Above it hang a little six by eight mirror. Midway between table and bed was the window with an icy white muslin frill over it, and opposite it was the nightstand. The whole apartment was of a rigidity not to be described in words, but which sent a shiver to the very marrow of Anne's bones. With a sob, she hastily discarded her garments, put on the skimpy nightgown, and sprang into bed, where she burrowed face down into the pillow and pulled the clothes up over her head. When Marla, when Marla came up for the light, various skimpy articles of raiment scattered most untidily over the floor, and a certain tempestuous appearance of the bed were the only indications of any presence save her own. She deliberately picked up Anne's clothes, placed them neatly on a prim yellow chair, then, taking up the candle, went to the bed. Good night, she said, a little awkward, she said, a little awkwardly, but not unkindly. Anne's white face and big eyes appeared over the bedclothes with a startling suddenness. How can you call it a good night when you know it must be the very worst night I've ever had? She said reproachfully. Then she dived down into invisibility again. Marla went slowly to the kitchen and proceeded to wash the supper dishes. Matthew was smoking a sure sign of perturbation of mind. He seldom smoked, for Marla set her face against it as a filthy habit. But at certain times and seasons, he felt driven to it. And then Marla winked at the practice, realizing that a mere man must have some venue for he, his emotions. Well, this is a pretty kettle of fish, she said wrathfully. This is what comes from sending word instead of going ourselves. Robert Spencer's folks have twisted that message somehow. One of us will have to drive over and see Mrs. Spencer for t tomorrow. That's for certain. This girl will have to be sent back to the asylum. Yes, I suppose so, said Matthew reluctantly. You suppose so? Don't you know it? Well, now, she's a real nice little thing, Marla. It's kind of a pity to send her back when she's so set on staying here. Matthew Cuthbert, you don't mean to say you think we ought to keep her. Marla's astonishment could not have been greater if Matthew had expressed a predicolition or standing on his head. Well, now, no, I suppose not. Not, not exactly, shammered Matthew uncomfortably driven into a corner for his precise meaning. I suppose we could hardly be expected to keep her. I should say not. What good would she be to us? We might be some good to her, said Matthew suddenly and unexpectedly. Matthew Cuthbert, I believe that child has bewitched you. I can see as plain as plain that you want to keep her. Well, no. She's a real interesting young thing, persisted Matthew. You should have heard her talk coming from the station. Oh, she can talk fast enough. I saw that at once. It's nothing in her favor either. I don't, I don't like children who have so much to say. I don't want an orphan girl. And if I did, she isn't the style I'd pick out. There's something I don't understand about her. No. She's to be dispatched straight away back to where she came from. 
I could hire a French boy to help me, said Matthew, and she'd be company for you. I'm not suffering for company, said Marla shortly, and I'm not going to keep her. Well, now, it's just as you say, of course, Marla, said Matthew, rising and putting his pipe away. I'm going to bed. To, to bed went Matthew, and to bed, when she had put her dishes away, went Marla, frowning most resolutely, and upstairs in the east gable, a lonely, heart-hungry, friendless child cried herself to sleep. Chapter 4 Morning at Green Gables It was broad daylight when Anne awoke and sat up in bed, staring confusedly at the window through which a flood of cheery sunshine was pouring, and outside of which something white and feathery waved across glimpses of blue sky. For a moment, she could not remember where she was. First came a delightful thrill, as if something very pleasant, and then a horrible remembrance. This was Green Gables, and they didn't want her because she was a boy. But it was morning, and yes, it was a cherry tree in full bloom outside her window. With a bound, she was out of bed and across the floor. She pushed up the sash. It went up stiffly and creakily, as if it hadn't been opened for a long time, which was the case. And it stuck so tight that nothing was needed to hold it up. Anne dropped on her knees and gazed out into the June morning, her eyes glistening with delight. Oh, wasn't it beautiful? Wasn't it a lovely place? Suppose she wasn't really going to stay here. She would imagine she was. There was a scope for imagination here. A huge cherry tree grew outside, so close that its brows tapped against the house, and it was so thick set with blossoms that hardly a leaf was to be seen. On both sides of the house was a big orchard, one of apple trees and one of cherry trees, also showered over with blossoms, and their grass was all sprinkled with dandelions. In the garden below were lilac trees purple with flowers, and their dismally sweet fragrance drifted up to the window on the morning wind. Below the garden, a green field lush with clover sloped down to the hollow where the brook ran and where scores of white birches grew, upspringingly airily out of an undergrowth suggestive of delightful possibilities in ferns and mosses and woodsy things generally. Beyond it was a hill, green and featherly, with spruce and fir. There was a gap in it where the gray gable end of the little house she had seen from the other side of the Lake of Shining Waters was visible. Off to the left were the big barns, and beyond them, away down over green, low-sloping fields, was a sparkling blue glimpse of sea. Anne's beauty-loving eyes lingered on it all, taking everything greedily in. She had looked on so many unlovely places in her life, poor child, but this was as lovely as anything she had ever dreamed. She knelt there, lost to everything but the loveliness around her, until she was startled by a hand on her shoulder. Marla had come in unheard by the small dreamer. It's time you dressed, she said curtly. Marla really did not know how to talk to the child, and her uncomfortable ignorance made her crisp and curt when she did not mean to be. Anne stood and drew a long breath. Oh, isn't it wonderful, she said, waving her hands comprehensively at the good world outside. It's a big tree, said Marla, and it blooms great, but the fruit don't amount to much ever. It's small and wormy. Oh, I don't mean just the tree. Of course it's lovely, but yes, it's radiantly lovely. It blooms as if it's meant to be. But I meant everything, the garden and the orchard and the brook and the woods, the whole big dear world. Don't you ever feel as if you've loved the world on a morning like this? and I can hear the brook laughing all the way up here. Have you ever noticed what cheerful things brooks are? They're always laughing, 
even in winter time, I've heard them under the ice. I'm so glad there's a brook near Green Gables. Perhaps you think it doesn't make any difference to me when you're not going to keep me, but it does. I shall always like to remember that there is a brook at Green Gables, even if I never see it again. If there isn't a brook, I'd be haunted by the uncomfortable feeling that there ought to be one. I'm not in the depths of despair this morning. I can never be in the mornings. Isn't it a splendid thing that there are mornings? But I feel very sad. I've just been imagining that it was really me you wanted after all, and I was to stay here forever and ever. It was a great comfort while it lasted. But the worst of imagining things is that the time comes when you have to stop, and that hurts. You better get dressed and come downstairs and never mind your imagining, said Marla as soon as she could get a word in edgewise. Breakfast is waiting. Wash your face and comb your hair. Leave the window up and turn your bed close back over the foot of the bed. Be as smart as you can. Anne could evidently be smart to some purpose, for she was downstairs in ten minutes' time, with her clothes neatly on, her hair brushed and braided, her face washed, and a comfortable consciousness pervading her soul that she had fulfilled all of Marla's requirements. As a matter of fact, however, she had forgotten to turn back the bedclothes. I'm pretty hungry this morning, she announced as she slipped into the chair Marla had placed for her. The world doesn't seem such a howling wilderness as it did last night. I'm so glad it's a sunshiny morning, but I like rainy mornings real well too. All sorts of mornings are interesting, don't you think? You don't know what's going to happen throughout the day, and there's so much scope for imagination. But I'm glad it's not rainy today, because it's easier to be cheerful and bear up under affliction on a sunshiny day. I feel that I have a good deal to bear up under. It's all very well to read about sorrows and imagine yourself living through them heroically, but it's not so nice when you really come to have them, is it? For pity's sake, hold your tongue, said Marla. You talk entirely too much for a little girl. Thereupon, Anne held her tongue so obediently and so thoroughly that her continued silence made Marla rather nervous, as if in the presence of something not entirely natural. Matthew also held his tongue, but this at least was natural, so the, the meal was a very silent one. As it progressed, Anne became more and more abstracted eating mechanically, with her big eyes fixed unswervingly and unseeingly on the sky outside the window. This made Marla more nervous than ever. She had an uncomfortable feeling that while this odd child's body might be there at the table, her spirit was far away in some remote, airy cloudland, borne aloft on the wings of imagination. <clears throat> Who would want such a child about the place? Yet Matthew wished to keep her of all unaccountable things. Marla felt he wanted it just as much this morning as he had the night before, and that he would go on wanting it. That was Matthew's way, take a whim into his head and cling to it with the most amazingly silent persistency, a persistency ten times more potent and effectual in its very silence than if he had talked it out. When the meal was ended, Anne came out of her revere and offered to wash the dishes. Can you wash dishes all right? said Marla distrustfully. Pretty well. I'm better at looking after children though. I've had so much experience at that. It's such a pity that you haven't had any here for me to look after. I don't feel as if I wanted any more children to look after than I've got at present. You're probably enough in all conscience. What's to be done with you? I don't know. Matthew is a most ridiculous man. I think he's lovely, said Anne reproachfully. He was so sympathetic. He didn't mind how much I talked. He seemed to like it. I felt that he was a kindred spirit as soon as I ever saw him. You're both queer enough, if that's what you mean by kindred spirit, Marla said with a sniff. Yes, you may wash the dishes. Take plenty of hot water and be sure you dry them well. I've got enough to attend to this morning, for I'll have to drive over to White Sands in the afternoon and see Mrs. Spencer. You'll come with me, and we'll settle what's to be done with you. After you've finished the dishes, go upstairs and make your bed." Anne washed the dishes deftly enough, as Marla, 
who kept a sharp eye on the process, discouraged. Later on, she made her bed less successfully, for she had never learned the art of wrestling with a feather tick. But it was done somehow and smoothed down, and then Marla, to get rid of her, told her she might go outdoors and amuse herself until dinner time. Anne flew to the door, her face alight, eyes glowing. On the very threshold, she stopped short, wheeled about, came back, and sat down by the table, light and glow as effectively blotted out as if someone had clamped an extinguisher on her. What's the matter now? demanded Marla. I don't dare go out, said Anne, in the tone of a martyr relinquishing all earthy joys. If I can't stay here, then there's no good in my loving green gables, and if I go out there and get acquainted with all of those trees and flowers in the orchard and the brook, I'll not be able to help loving it. It's hard enough now, so I won't make it any harder. I want to go out so much, everything seems to be calling to me. Anne, Anne, come out to us. Anne, Anne, we want a playmate. But it better not. There's no use in loving things if you have to be torn from them, is there? And it's so hard to keep from loving things, isn't it? That's why I was so glad when I thought I was going to live here. I thought I'd have so many things to love and nothing to hinder me. But that brief dream is over. I am resigned to my fate now, so I don't think I'll go out for fear I'll get unresigned again. What is the name of that geranium on the windowsill, please? That's the apple-scented geranium. Oh, I don't mean that sort of name. I mean, just the name you gave it yourself. Didn't you give it a name? May I give it one then? May I call it, oh, let me see, Bonnie will do. May I call it Bonnie while I'm here? Oh, do let me. Goodness, I don't care. But where on earth is the sense of naming a geranium? Oh, I like things to have handles, even when they are only geraniums. It makes it seem more like people. How do you know but that it hurts a geranium's feelings to be just called a geranium and nothing else? You wouldn't like to be called nothing but woman all the time. Yes, I shall call it Bonnie. I named that cherry tree outside my bedroom window this morning. I called it Snow Queen because it was so white. Of course, it won't always be in bloom, but one can imagine that it is, can't one? I never in my life saw or heard anything to equal her, muttered Marla, bearing a retreat down cellar after potatoes. She is kind of interesting, as Matthew says. I can feel already that I'm wondering what on earth she'll say next. She'll be casting a spell over me too. She cast it over Matthew. That look he gave me when he went out said everything he said and hinted last night over again. I wish he was like other men and would talk things out. A body could answer back and argue him into reason. But what's to be done with a man who just looks? Anne had relapsed into revere with her chin in her hands and her eyes on the sky when Marla returned from her cellar pilgrimage. There Marla left her until the early dinner was on the table. I suppose I can have the mare and buggy this afternoon, Matthew, said Marla. Matthew nodded and looked wistfully at Anne. Marla intercepted the look and said grimly, I'm going to drive over to White Sands and settle this thing. I'll take Anne with me, and Mrs. Spencer will probably make arrangements to send her back to Nova Scotia at once. I'll set your tea out for you, and I'll be home in time to milk the cows. Still, Matthew said nothing, and Marla had a sense of having wasted words and breath. There is nothing more aggravating than a man who won't talk back, unless it's a woman who won't. Matthew hitched the sorrel into the buggy in due time, and Marla and Anne set off. Matthew opened the yard gate for them, and as they drove slowly through, he said to no one in particular, as it seemed, Little Jerry Boat from the creek was here this morning, and I told him I guessed I'd hired him for the summer. Marla made no reply, but she hit the unlucky sorrel with such a vicious clip with the whip that the fat mare, unused to such treatment, whizzed indignantly down the lane at an alarming pace. Marla looked back once as the 
Buggy bounced along and saw that the aggravating Matthew was leaned over the gate, looking wistfully after them. Chapter 5 Anne's History Do you know, said Anne confidently, I've made up my mind to enjoy this drive. It's been my experience that you can nearly always enjoy things if you make up your mind firmly that you will. Of course, you must make it up firmly. I'm not going to think about going back to the asylum while we're having our drive. I'm just going to think about the drive. Oh, look, there's one early wild rose out. Isn't it lovely? Do you think it must be glad to be a rose? Wouldn't it be nice if roses could talk? I'm sure they could tell us such lovely things. And isn't pink the most bewitching color in the world? I love it, but I can't wear it. Red-haired people can't wear pink, not even in imagination. Did you ever know of anyone whose hair was red when she was young, but got to be another color when she grew up? No, I don't think I ever did, said Marla mercilessly. And I don't think it's likely to happen in your case either. And sighed. Well, that is another hope gone. My life is a perfect graveyard of buried hopes. That's a sentence I read in a book once and I say it over to comfort myself whenever I'm disappointed in anything. I don't see where the comforting comes in myself, said Marla. Why, because it sounds so nice and romantic, just as if I were a heroine in a book, you know. I'm so fond of romantic things, and a graveyard full of buried hopes is about as romantic a thing as one can imagine, isn't it? I'm rather glad I have one. Are we going across the Lake of Shining Waters today? We're not going over Barry's Pond, if that's what you mean by your Lake of Shining Waters. We're going by the Shore Road. Shore Road sounds nice, said Anne dreamily. Is it as nice as it sounds? Just when you said Shore Road, I saw it in a picture in my mind, as quick as that. And White Sands is a pretty name too, but I don't like it as well as Avonlea. Avonlea is a lovely name. It sounds like music. How far is it to White Sands? It's five miles, and as you're evidently bent on talking, you might as well talk to some purpose by telling me what you know about yourself. Oh, what I know about myself isn't really worth telling, said Anne eagerly. If only you'd let me tell you what I imagine about myself, you'd think it ever so much more interesting. No, I don't want any of your imaginacy. Just you stick to bald facts. Begin at the beginning. Where were you born, and how old are you? I was 11 last March, said Anne, resigning herself to bald facts with a little sigh. And I was born in Bowling Brook, Nova Scotia. My father's name was Walter Shirley, and he was a teacher at Bowling Brook High School. My mother's name was Bertha Shirley. Aren't Walter and Bertha lovely names? I'm glad my parents had nice names. It would be a real disgrace to have a father named, well, say, Jedediah, wouldn't it? I guess it doesn't matter what a person's name is, as long as he behaves himself, said Marla, feeling herself called upon to inoculate a good and useful moral. Well, I don't know, Anne looked thoughtful. I read in a book once that a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, but I had never been able to believe it. I don't believe a rose would be as nice if it was called a thistle or a skunk cabbage. I suppose my father could have been a good man, even if he had been called Jedediah, but I'm sure it would have been a cross. Well, my mother was a teacher in the high school too, but when she married father, she gave up teaching, of course. A husband was enough responsibility. Mrs. Thomas said that they were a pair of babies and as poor as church mice. They went to live in a teeny weeny little house in Bolingbrook. I've never seen that house, but I've imagined it thousands of times. I think it must have had honeysuckle over the parlor window and lilacs in the front yard and lilies of the valley just inside the gate. Yes, and muslin curtains in the, all the windows. Muslin curtains give a house such an air. I was born in that house. Mrs. Thomas said I was the homeliest baby she had ever seen. I was so scrawny and tiny and nothing but eyes. But mother thought I was perfectly beautiful, 
I should think a mother would be a better judge than a poor woman who came in to scrub, wouldn't you? I'm glad she was satisfied with me anyhow. I would feel so sad if I thought I was a disappointment to her, because she didn't live very long after that, you see. She died of fever when I was three months old. I do wish she lived long enough for me to remember calling her mother. I think it would be so sweet to say mother, don't you? And father died four days after from fever too. That left me an orphan and folks were at their wit's end. So Mrs. Thomas said, what to do with me? You see, nobody wanted me even then. It seems to be my fate. Father and mother had both come from places far away and it was well known that they hadn't any relatives living. Finally, Mrs. Thomas said that she'd take me, though she was poor and had a drunken husband. She brought me up by hand. Do you know if there's anything in being brought up by hand that ought to make people who are brought up that way better than other people? Because whenever I was naughty, Mrs. Thomas would ask me how I could be such a bad girl when she had brought me up by hand, reproachful like. Mr. and Mrs. Thomas moved away from Bolingbrook to Marysville, and I lived with them until I was eight years old. I helped look after the Thomas children. There were four of them younger than me, and I can tell you they took a lot of looking after. Then Mr. Thomas was killed falling under a train, and his mother offered to take Mrs. Thomas and the children, but she didn't want me. Mrs. Thomas was at her wit's end, so she said what to do with me. Then Mrs. Hammond from up the river came down and said she'd take me, seeing as I was handy with children, and I went up the river to live with her in a little clearing among the stumps. It was a very lonesome place. I'm sure I could have never lived there if I hadn't any imagination. Mr. Hammond worked a small sawmill up there, and Mrs. Hammond had eight children. She had twins three times. I like babies in moderation, but twins three times in succession is too much. I told Miss Hammond so firmly when the last pair came, I used to get so dreadfully tired carrying them about. I lived upriver with Mrs. Hammond over two years. Then Mr. Hammond died and Mrs. Hammond broke up her house Kimi. She divided her children among her relatives and went to the States. I had to go to the asylum at Hopeton because no one would take me. They didn't want me at the asylum either. They said they were overcrowded as it was, but they had to take me and I was there four months until Mrs. Spencer came. Anne finished up with another sigh of relief this time. Evidently, she did not like talking about her experiences in a world that had not wanted her. Did you ever go to school? demanded Marla, turning the sorrel mare down the shore road. Not a great deal. I went a little the last year I stayed with Mrs. Thomas. When I went up river, we were so far from the school that I couldn't walk it in the winter, and there was vacation in the summer, so I could only go in the spring and fall. But of course I went while I was at the asylum. I can read pretty well, and I know ever so many pieces of poetry off by heart. The Battle of Holling Lynn and Edinburgh after Folin and Linge on the Rhine and lots of the Lady of the Lake and most of the Seasons by James Thompson. Don't you just love poetry that gives you a crinkly feeling up and down your back? There's a piece in the fifth reader, The Downfall of Poland, that is just full of thrills. Of course, I wasn't in the fifth reader. I was only in the fourth but the big girls used to lend me theirs to read. Were those women, Mrs. Thomas and Mrs. Hammond, good to you? Asked Marla, looking at Anne out of the corner of her eye. Oh, faltered Anne. Her sensitive little face suddenly flushed scarlet and embarrassment sat on her brow. Oh, they meant to be. I know they meant to be just as good and as kind as possible. And when people need to be good to you, you don't mind very much when they're not quite always. They had a good deal to worry about, about, you know. It's very trying to have a drunken husband, you see, and it must be very trying to have twins three times in succession, don't you think? But I'm sure they meant to be good to me. Marla asked no more questions. Anne gave herself up to a silent rapture over the shore road, and Marla guided the sorrel abstractedly while she pondered deeply. Pity was suddenly stirring in her heart for the child. What a starved, unloved life she had had. 
a life of drudgery and poverty and neglect. For Marla was shrewd enough to read between the lines of Anne's history and divine the truth. No wonder she had been so delighted at the prospect of a real home. It was a pity she had to be sent back. What if she, Marla, should indulge Matthew's unaccountable whim and let her stay? He was set on it, and the child seemed a nice, teachable little thing. She's got too much to say, thought Marla, but she might be trained out of that. And there's nothing rude or slangy in what she does say. She's ladylike. It's likely her parents were nice folk. The, wood, the shore road was woodsy and wild and lonesome. On the right hand, scrub firs, their spirits quite unbroken by long years of tussle with the gulf winds, grew thickly. On the left were the steep red sandstone cliffs, so near the track in places that a mare of less steadiness than the sorrel might have tried the nerves of the people behind her. Down at the base of the cliffs, were heaps of surf-worn rock, or sandy little coves inlaid with pebbles as with ocean jewels. Beyond lay the sea, shimmering and blue, and over it soared the gulls, their pintions flashing silverly in the sunlight. Oh, isn't the sea wonderful, said Anne, rousing from a long, wide-eyed silence. Once, when I lived in Marysville, Mr. Thomas hired an express wagon and took us all to spend the day at the shore 10 miles away. I enjoyed every moment of that day, even if I had to look after the children all the time. I lived it over in happy dreams for years. But this shore is nicer than the Marysville shore. Aren't those gulls splendid? Would you like to be a gull? I think I would. That is, if I couldn't be a human girl. Don't you think it would be nice to wake up at sunrise and swoop down over the water and fly away that lovely blue all day and then at night to fly back to one's nest? Oh, I can just imagine myself doing it. What's big house is that just ahead, please? That's the White Sands Hotel. Mr. Kirk runs it, but the season hasn't begun yet. There's heaps of Americans come here for the summer. They think the shore is just about right. Oh, I was afraid it might be Mrs. Spencer's place, said Anne mournfully. I don't want to get there. Somehow, it'll seem like the end of everything. Chapter 6. Marla Makes Up Her Mind Get there they did, however, in due season. Mrs. Spencer lived in a big yellow house at White Sands Cove, and she came to the door with surprise and welcome mingled on her benevolent face. Dear, dear, she exclaimed, you're the last folks I was looking for today, but I'm real glad to see you. You put your horse in, and how are you, Anne? I'm just as well as can be expected, thank you, said Anne smilelessly. A blight seemed to have descended on her. I suppose we'll stay a little while to rest the mare, said Marla, but I promised Matthew I'd be home early. The fact is, Mrs. Spencer, there's been a queer mistake somewhere, and I've come over to see where it is. We sent word, Matthew and I, for you to bring us a boy from the asylum. We told your brother Robert to tell you we wanted a boy 10 or 11 years old. Marla Cuthbert, you don't say so, said Mrs. Spencer in distress. Why, Robert sent the word down by his daughter Nancy, and she said she wanted a girl. Didn't she, Flora Jane? appealing to her daughter who had come out to the steps. She certainly did, Miss Cuthbert, corroborated Laura Jane earnestly. I'm dreadfully sorry, said Mrs. Spencer. It is too bad, but it certainly wasn't my fault, you see, Miss Cuthbert. I did the best I could, and I thought I was following your instructions. Nancy is a terrible flighty thing. I've often had to scold her well for her heedlessness. It was our own fault, said Marla resignedly. We should have come to you ourselves and not left an important message to be passed along by word of mouth in that fashion. Anyhow, the mistake has been made and the only thing to do is to set it right. Can we send the child back to the asylum 
I suppose they'll take her back, won't they? I suppose so, said Mrs. Spencer thoughtfully, but I don't think it will be necessary to send her back. Mrs. Peter Pewitt was up here yesterday, and she was saying to me how much she wished she had sent by me for a little girl to help her. Mrs. Peter has a large family, you know, and she finds it hard to get help. Anne will be the very girl for her. I call it positively providential. Marla did not look as if she thought Providence had much to do with the matter. Here was an unexpectedly good chance to get this unwelcome orphan off her hands, and she did not even feel grateful for it. She knew Miss Peter Pluett only by sight as a small, shrewish-faced woman without an ounce of superfluous flesh on her bones. But she had heard of her. A terrible worker and driver, Mrs. P Peter was said to be, and discharged servant girls told fearsome tales of her temper and stinginess and her family of pert, quarrelsome children. Marla felt a qualm of conscience at the thought of handing Anne over to her tender mercies. Well, I'll go in and we'll talk the matter over, she said. And if there isn't Miss Peter coming up the lane this blessed minute, exclaimed Mrs. Spencer, bustling her guests through the hall into the parlor where a deadly chill struck on them as if the air had been strained so long through dark green, closely drawn blinds that it had lost every particle of warmth it had ever possessed. That is real lucky, for we can settle the matter right away. Take the armchair, Miss Cuthbert, and Anne, you sit here on the ottoman, and don't wiggle. Let me take your hats. Laura Jane, go out and put the kettle on. Good afternoon, Miss Plewitt. We were just saying how fortunate it was you happened along. Let me introduce you two ladies. Mrs. Plewitt, Miss Cuthbert. Please excuse me for a moment. I forgot to tell Laura Jane to take the buttons out of the oven. Mrs. Spencer whisked away after pulling up the blinds. Anne, sitting mutely on the ottoman with her hands clasped tightly in her lap, stared at Mrs. Plewitt as one fascinated. Was she to be given into the keeping of this sharp-faced, sharp-eyed woman? She felt a lump coming up in her throat, and her eyes smarted painfully. She was beginning to be afraid she couldn't keep the tears back when Mrs. Spencer returned, flushed and beaming, quite capable of taking any and every difficulty, physical, mental, or spiritual, into consideration and settling it out of hand. There seems to have been a mistake about this little girl, Mrs. Plewitt, she said. I was under the impression that Mr. and Miss Cuthbert wanted a little girl to adopt. I was certainly told so, but it seems it was a boy they wanted. So, if you still have the same mind you were yesterday, I think she'll be just the thing for you. Miss Plewitt darted her eyes over Anne from head to foot. But, how old are you, and what is your name? She demanded. Anne Shirley, faltered the shrinking child, not daring to make any stipulations regarding the spe spelling thereof. And I'm 11 years old. Huh! You don't look as if there was much to you, but you're wiry. I don't know, but the wiry ones are the best after all. Well, if I take you, you'll have to be a good girl, you know, good and smart and respectful. I'll expect you to earn your keep, and no mistake about that. Yes, I suppose I might as well take her off your hands, Miss Cuthbert. The baby's awful fractious, and I'm clean worn out attending to him. If you'd like, I can take her home, right home now. Marla looked at Anne and softened at sight of the child's pale face with its look of mute misery. The misery of a helpless little creature who finds itself once again caught in the trap from which it had escaped. Marla felt an uncomfortable conviction that if she denied the appeal of that look, it would haunt her to her dying day. Moreover, she did not fancy Miss Pewitt to hand a sensitive, high-strung child over to such a woman. No, she could not take the responsibility of doing that. Well, I don't know, she said slowly. I didn't say that Matthew and I had absolutely decided that we wouldn't keep her, 
In fact, I may say that Matthew is supposed to keep her. I just came to find out how the mistake had occurred. I think I'd better take her home again and talk it over with Matthew. I feel that I ought to decide on anything without consulting him. If we make our mind up not to keep her, we'll bring or send her over to you tomorrow night. If we don't, you may know that she is going to stay with us. Will that suit you, Mrs. Pluett? I suppose it will have to do, said Miss Pluett ungraciously. During Marla's speech, a sunrise had been dawning on Anne's face. First, the look of despair faded out. Then came a faint flush of hope. Her eyes grew deep and bright as morning stars. The child was quite transfigured, and a moment later, when Mrs. Spencer and Mrs. Pluett went out in quest of a recipe the later had come to borrow, she sprang up and flew across the room to Marla. Oh, Miss Cuthbert, did you really say that perhaps you would let me stay at Green Gables? She said in a breathless whisper, as if speaking out loud might shatter the glorious possibilities. Did you really mean it? Or did I only imagine that you did? I think you'd better learn to control that imagination of yours, Anne, if you can't distinguish between what is real and what isn't, said Marla crossly. Yes, you did hear me say just that, and no more. It isn't decided yet, and perhaps we will conclude to let Mrs. Pluett take you after all. She certainly needs you much more than I do. I'd rather go back to the asylum than go to live with her, said Anne passionately. She looks exactly like, like a gimlet. Martha smothered a smile under the conviction that Anne must be reproved for such a speech. A little girl like you should be ashamed of talking so about a lady and a stranger, she said severely. Go back and sit down quietly and hold your tongue and just behave as a good late girl should. I'll try and do and be anything you want me, if only you'll keep me, said Anne returning meekly to the ottoman. When they arrived back at Green Gables that evening, Matthew met them in the lane. Marla from afar had noted him prowling along it and guessed his motive. She was prepared for the relief she read in his face when she saw she had at least brought Anne back with her, but she said nothing to him relative to the affair until they were both out in the yard behind the barn milking the cows. Then she briefly told him Anne's history and the result of the interview with Mrs. Spencer. I wouldn't give a dog I liked to that Pluett woman, said Matthew with unusual vim. I don't fancy her style myself, admitted Marla, but it's that we're keeping her ourselves, Matthew. And since you seem to want her, I suppose I'm willing, or I'll have to be. I've been thinking over the idea until I've kind of gotten used to it. It seems a sort of duty. I've never brought up a child, especially a girl, and I dare say I'll make a terrible mess of it. But I'll do my best. So far as I'm concerned, Matthew, she may stay. Matthew's shy face was a glow of delight. Well, now, I reckoned you'd come to see that. Light, Marla, he said. She's such an interesting little thing. It'd be more to the point if you could say she was a useful little thing, retorted Marla. But I'll make it my business to see that she's trained to that. And mind, Matthew, you're not to go interfering with my methods. Perhaps an old maid doesn't know much about bringing up a child, but I'll guess she'll know more than an old bachelor. So you just leave me to manage her. When I fail, it'll be time enough for you to put your oar in. There, there, Marla. You can have your own way, said Matthew reassuringly. Only be as good and kind to her as you can be without spoiling her. I kind of think she's one of those sort you can do anything with if you'll only get her to love you. Martha sniffed to express her contempt for Matthew's opinion concerning anything feminine and walked off to the dairy with the pails. I won't tell her tonight that she can stay, she reflected as she strained the milk onto the creamers. She'd be so excited she wouldn't sleep a wink. Marla Cuthbert, you're fairly in for it. Did you ever suppose you'd see the day when you'd be adopting an orphan girl? It's surprising enough, but not so surprising 
as that Matthew should be at the bottom of it, him that always seemed to have such a mortal dread of little girls. Anyhow, we've decided on the experiment, and goodness only knows what will come of it. And that is the end of our section for today. Thank you for watching today's video. I hope my first attempt at video editing wasn't too disjointed for you. During my reading, were there a lot of words that you didn't know? Drop a comment below if you'd like me to start putting uh, vocab words up on the screen as I'm reading. Have a lovely rest of your day. Bye!